Bible underneath your chair, Bible in your head if you've got it all memorized. I mean, that would be, that'd be pretty amazing if you got all, all the Bible memorized, or if you've memorized all of Philippians. I mean, that also works since you know, we're only in Philippians right now. But we are in, on page 982, Philippians chapter 4. And we're only going to be covering uh, verses 4 to 7. So Philippians 4, 4 to 7, page 982, if you're using church Bible. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be, be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Blessed be the reading of God's holy word. Let's pray really quick. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the chance to come to your word and to hear from you, understand it better, to get to know you better, and also to um, come away with being able to apply it to our lives better. And we pray, Lord, that as we come to your word, Lord, that you would um, change us, that you would sanctify us, you would make us more and more holy, more and more like you. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Um, either uh, this past week or last week, I was uh, watching... Uh, someone's uh, life story. They were telling about how they, you know, grew up in a good family, but they kind of squandered uh, the privilege that they had, and they got into, you know, dealing drugs and taking drugs, and um, to the point where, you know, they were really, really rich. Unfortunately, they were also doing drugs as well as dealing drugs, so they were spending a lot of their money on their own drugs to do it themselves. So. Probably not the best business plan, but, um, you know, so it was this guy who was uh, into drugs, into uh, lots of money, everything that he could uh, ask for, and uh, he thought he, he would never get caught. He thought he was really smart, um, but someone in his own organization ratted him out, and the police showed up and uh, busted down his door, and he landed in prison. And uh, in prison, you know, of course, he's just, you know, rethinking his life and, you know, uh, being detached from the drug life and the life of excess and the money. You know, he's like, Man, what, do, what do I have now? What should I, what should I be doing with my life? And uh, he decided he would uh, do the one thing that he always kind of wanted to do but never got to do, which was stand-up comedy. But you didn't see that coming. And so... Uh, you know, the video was, you know, about him sharing about his life, and at the end, you know, where they, you know, come with that, you know, the heartfelt, like, you know, oh, that's so, so touching moment, he's like, and I realized that drugs and money, you know, they don't fully satisfy, they don't, they don't, they don't last forever, and, like, in that moment, I'm like, so you're telling me that stand-up comedy does? Like, is this the application we're coming to? That drugs and money don't satisfy and they don't last forever? Uh, but fortunately, he found stand-up comedy. And so, uh, you know, stand-up comedy is gonna fulfill him and last forever. You know, part of me is like, man, I really, well, actually a big part of me the, the part, pastor part of me is like, man, I wish someone just told him about Jesus in prison. <laughs> um, but anyways, in, in Philippians this morning, Paul is going to talk about three things, three circumstances that never change. Whereas in money, drugs, and stand-up comedy will not always be around. They will not always satisfy. They will, they will not always... Uh, you know, be good. Um, Paul tells us about three circumstances that will always be true. And in these circumstances, how do we, how should we react? How should we live in those circumstances that will always be true? And this is very useful because, you know, they're always going to be true. 
So you know these applications are always going to be valid. There's never going to be a time where these applications be like, well, you know, I got to wait till I get married first. I got to wait till, you know, this happens and that happens. Or, you know, I got to store this in my memory. Like one of those like survival things. Like, like in, in you know, I, I, I you know, to see, see people saying, you know, in the case of, you know, this black bear, do this. In the case of like a brown bear, no, you can't do that. You have to do something else. And I'm like, I, I'm not going to remember it by the time when, you know, I'm faced with this situation and this crisis. And I'm going to remember, oh, I need to do this certain thing, but not that, because that's going to send the right, wrong message to the bear and I'm going to die. Uh, Paul says these situations are always, always going to happen. These situations are always true. And so, therefore, how we live in these moments is always going to be applicable. Um, it's, it's not my planning that there are three things. That's, Paul, that's on Paul. So, you know, don't blame me for, you know, being all pastoral and having three points. That's, uh, that's Paul's. That's, that's on Paul, not on me. All right, so the first thing. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. All right, verse 4. What is the situation? Um, I always read this, and I'm like, Paul is, is telling us, right, that we always need to remember Jesus, and then that gives us the, the opportunity, that gives us the reminder to be joyful. But I was reading a commentary this week that really struck me, and, and the writer was saying that, being in the Lord, being in Jesus is not the, you know, what triggers the joy. That's actually the situation. The situation is being in the Lord. And the response is joy. Um, last Sunday school, uh, last few Sunday schools, uh, for, for the older adults, you know, one thing we were talking about was the temple. And, you know, just how important it was for the Old Testament saints. You know, you, you need to, you, you, want, you want to be close to God, you got to go to the temple. That's why the psalmist says, you know, better is one day in your courts in the temple than anywhere elsewhere. And he says, I'd rather be a bird uh, I'd rather be a doorkeeper. You know, I'd rather be any of those people that get to spend all their day in the temple and I don't have to go away. The temple was that kind of uh, presence for the Israelite people. And now the good news has come that we don't have to go to a certain place to encounter God. We don't need to go to a particular building to be close to God, to be in his presence, to commune with him, to talk with him, to hear from him. That's the good news. Well, I mean, that's not the good news, but that's one of the, one of the, the big applications, the corollaries of the good news of Jesus Christ dying for our sins is now that he's removed that barrier that stands between us and God and now... We don't have to go to a location to commune with God. After Jesus goes to heaven, he sends the Holy Spirit. Now God, one member of the Trinity, dwells within each one of us. And so we can encounter God in our daily Bible readings. We can encounter God as we pray when, wherever we are. We can encounter God at work. We can commune with God in school. We can be with God at a uh, you know, Christmas gathering, wherever we are. The good news that Paul says is that our situation that is always true is that we are in the Lord. That we're in the Lord. One of the one of the best part about being married or like having that, that actual wedding is that at the end of the day, 
you and your significant other do not need to say goodbye. Right? When you're dating or engaged, you shouldn't be living together. As your pastor, I gotta say this, you shouldn't be living with the other, each other. At the end of the day, you should separate. And that's heartbreaking if you're in that kind of relationship. But the most wonderful thing happens when you get married. After the wedding day, you no longer need to say goodbye. Good night. In that kind of separation. And with Jesus, we are brought into that kind of relationship with God that we are now with him all the time, and it's now a permanent situation that we're with him. It's not you go to church, you go to the temple, and then you have to say goodbye. Paul says this is the permanent, always-on situation. You are with the Lord. And if this is the situation... Our response must be joy. Like, it doesn't even need, like, to be said almost. I mean, Paul just reminds us because, you know, some, a lot of times as we, you know, live this Christian life, we get used to it. And, and we forget the joy, the privilege that we have of always being to tap into the presence of God always being close to God. And so Paul reminds us, rejoice, rejoice. That's, that's always the situation you're in. You've always got something to be joyful for. And so the life of the Christian should be marked with joy. We shouldn't be somber people always walking around and you know, the people on the outside of church know when they see a Christian because of the frown, because of the joy that's lacking from their lives. No. People should be able to point out Christians because of the joy. Because we've got the presence of the Lord always, at all times, everywhere we are, no matter where we go. Right? So that's the first situation that is always true. We are always in the Lord. And because we are always in the Lord, we must rejoice. Second verse, second, second point, fourth, uh, fifth verse. Let your reasonableness, and now you have a little footnote that leads down to the bottom of the page that says, or gentleness, um, be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. And I know the ESV seems to put the Lord as a hand as part of the next verse. Um, in the Greek, it's its own separate thing, and so commentators are always you know, debating, does it go with what came before or what comes after? Uh, but as I was reading through this passage and I was understanding Paul giving three things that are always true, I think it fit better with what came before, not that it doesn't go with what comes after, but just for the sake of this morning and understanding uh, these three things that are always true, we're going to put it with what comes before, that let our reasonableness, and the reason why it's translated differently in different Bibles is because there's no real good, like, one-on-one -on -one English word that translates this Greek word. Uh, the Greek word means uh, someone, um, this kind of spirit that is willing to let go of your own rights. It's, it's usually used in kind of secular Greek ancient writings for, you know, nobles and kings who just like, oh, the peasant, peasants want to do this, and oh, well, we should let them have it because they're peasants. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, that, you know, we deserve this as the king, um, but, as, and as nobles, but we'll, we'll let it slide. And Paul's using, Paul's saying, church, have this kind of attitude of, yes, these are your rights. These are things that you uh, rightfully own and have, but you should be willing to let them go. So it's translated gentleness, reasonableness. Um, maybe you can translate it generous. Um, but the reason why it links with the Lord is at hand 
is if you are playing a game, whether sports, video game, board game, card game, whatever it is, what is the situation where one of the players is the most generous? Where even if you like cheat or do something that breaks the rules to get ahead, they'll just let you do it. The only instance that they will let you do that is if they're so far ahead that their victory is secure. Right? If, if it's down to the wire, it could go either way. Uh, both players are going to you know, be making sure that every single speck of rule is followed <laughs> to get every single point they can, to get ahead in any single way they can. And so the only way you can be gracious and say, well, yeah, sure, that's the rule, but I'll let you have it, is if you are going to win. So that's the situation. Paul says the situation that is always true is the Lord is at hand. What does it mean, the Lord is at hand? That means Jesus is coming and our victory is secure. Always true. And if this is true, if Jesus is coming soon, which he is, and our victory is secure, which it is, Paul says, be reasonable, gentle, gracious. Be willing to give up your rights. Sure, these are things you can hold on to. These are things you deserve. You don't have to put up with injustice. But Paul says, give it up. Victory is at hand. So Jesus says, someone tells you to go one mile, go two. Why? Because because you're a glutton for punishment? No, because victory is at hand. There's nothing that other person can do to take away my victory. So sure, just have the extra mile. It doesn't matter. And if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek as well. Does it matter whether it's left, right cheek, left cheek? No, it doesn't matter because victory is at hand. Jesus is coming soon. There's nothing that slap can do to take away your victory in Jesus. So give him the slap. Give him two slaps. Paul says, Jesus, it doesn't matter. Your victory is secure. Jesus says, if someone sues you for your tunic, give them the cl your cloak as well. Your, your cloak is not legally obligated. But Jesus is saying the same thing Paul is saying. Your victory is secure. The Lord is at hand. Sure, he wants to take something that's yours. Give him something else. Why? Your victory is secure. It doesn't matter whether he takes one thing or two things. It doesn't matter what kind of injustice you face. Nothing other people can do to you will take away your victory in Jesus. Nothing anyone else can do can rob you of your treasures in heaven. And so Paul says, what is true all the time? It is always true. The Lord is at hand. Your victory is secure. And because your victory is secure, don't be someone that stands on their rights. Don't be someone that doesn't budge an inch. Don't be someone that is not generous. Let it go. You've already won. So the three things are always true. First, it is always true that we are in the Lord, and so therefore we must rejoice. Secondly, the Lord is always at hand. Our victory is secure. Our treasure in heaven is there. So let your reasonableness, your gentleness, let it be known to everyone at school, in your work, in the legal system, whatever. 
that you're willing to just let things slide. You're willing to give up your rights. You're willing to be at a loss. Because we already have the victory. Now, of course, that might lead us into some anxiety. Like, am I just going to be a doormat for the whole world to step on? Next verse, verse 6. Let's take a look at the next thing that will always be true. Do not be anxious about anything. Right? So it's always true that we're in the Lord. It's always true that the Lord is, uh, is at hand. And it's always true that we should not be anxious, no matter what we're facing. It literally says in the Greek, about everything, do not worry. What should we do instead? What should be our response? But in everything, right, there's that kind of symmetry in the Greek that we kind of miss in the English, right? In everything, don't worry, but in everything, pray. So in the situation that is always true, don't worry, we should always make our requests known to God. And he says kind of different parts of that. In prayer and supplication, um, the Bible scholars uh, seem to be pretty, pretty unanimous that he's, he's not trying to draw out two separate things, that this is prayer, this is a supplication. Paul often uses those two words inter interchangeably, uh, that you should be in prayer, prayer and supplication for God. You should always be asking him about your situation. You should always be uh, telling him, What's up? You should always asking him the concerns of your heart, those things that you know are tempting you to worry. Always lift those up to God. But the thing that is important is to add with thanksgiving. That God is not Santa Claus. He's not. Uh, he doesn't. Uh, he's not required to cater to your every need and whim. My, my wife has found some cats outside that she feeds, um, partially because one of them is really cute, um, but partially because our cat that we actually own doesn't want to eat any of its cat food that the vet says we've got to feed him. And so there's lots of leftovers. And as Chinese people, uh, or as you know, people that have brought up not to leave leftovers and not let things go to waste, um, obviously they have to go somewhere. And I'm not eating it. So um, it's going outside. It's going, to, it's going to some stray cats that live in the neighborhood. And um, not the one that's really cute, but I think it's a mom. Uh, she is very demanding. Uh, she's the queen. She just come in like just gracefully like come in. It's time for food, peasant. Feed me. But she knows it's only my wife that feeds her. So if if I go outside and I'm like taking out the garbage, she'll be like, oh. The other human's here. I must let him know to get the other human that feeds me. And she will she will let me know that she's around. She'll be extra visible to let me know so that I can go inside and tell my wife uh, the needy cat is outside and, and she demands food. And I was thinking the other day, why, how can she be so demanding? Like, we get nothing from her. <laughs> like, literally. Like, yes, once in a while there'll be a bird on the steps, but I, I'm convinced that's not our present that's leftovers. That's you know something they killed for fun and didn't want to eat. Right? That's not a present. That's a leftover toy. So they don't give us anything. 
why why should we keep on giving these people these cats um, everything they desire? Paul says, "Don't don't be that cat." In your prayer and supplication, all your prayers and supplication should be in an attitude of, of thanksgiving. That's why I said, with thanksgiving. All right, so the prayer and supplication is the means in how we make our request known to God. But how we do this, the attitude that we do this, is with thanksgiving. And that makes all the difference. Because we are creatures, not the creator, and he doesn't owe us anything. He doesn't even owe us, you know, the food that we eat, the air that we breathe. All that is grace of God. And so therefore, you know, God himself has told us, you know, ask of me. But we need to do it in an attitude of thanksgiving of knowing that everything we already have is from him. When he answers us, that's a reason to give thanks. We need to have this attitude of thanksgiving as we present our uh, prayers and petitions to God. All right, so in that, that situation that is always true, do not be anxious. Our response must be, we must pray to God. We must always be in a attitude, uh, a you know, a, a, an engaging in constant prayer and communication with God. And he says, kind of why this is, verse seven. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. How is God answering these prayers? He's answering them with peace. Now, he might answer your prayers with exactly what you're asking for. He might not. But no matter what his response is, he's always going to be giving peace. Right? No matter what your prayer is, even if you're asking for the wrong thing, God's answer is going to be peace. So, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, that means it's greater than we can even imagine, bigger than we can even hope for, will guard your heart. Guard is a military term. That means God's peace is standing at the entrance of your heart and your mind. And those worries are going to come up to the gate. And the guard, which is the peace of God, says, you can't enter here. This is a no, this is a worry-free zone. You cannot come here. So we pray to God. God gives us his peace, and that peace stands guard over our hearts and our minds to protect us from worry and anxiety. So we'll guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So these are the three situations that are always true. Right? It's always true that we are in the Lord. It is always true uh, that the Lord is at hand. We have the victory. And it's always true that we must not worry. And so because these things are always true, our response, the joy, the rejoicing, the reasonableness, the gentleness, the prayer must always be true as well and should mark our lives as Christians. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is so applicable, not just for the little things, and we just thank you that your word is applicable in those tiny, very uh, niche, very specific things. Um, but we also thank you, Lord, that your word is true and applicable for things that are always true, that we will always face, that is always true every second of the day. And we pray, Lord, that our Christian lives would be, in turn, marked with his joy and reasonableness and prayer. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.